Ryan. My name is uh, Jim Turner. I'm a white, kind of nearly late 50s, got grey hair. I'm wearing a, a purple hooded top in front of some shelves. And um, I'm currently chair of Ellie Sig. And uh, Ellie Sig is a community, as I was saying before, of tell technologists and researchers and academics and practitioners who want to come together to try and learn more about the learner's experience in the in that world of learning technology. So this session uh, is going to focus on AI and neurodiversity and we've got a couple of different speakers um, and the community is really trying to uh, connect up people um, and share those experiences. And you can join us by uh, joining JISC Mail and finding us on there where we post out about our, our um, sessions. But you'll also, if you're members of communities like CEDA and uh, ALT, you'll also find us advertising on there. And in a second, we'll hear from Dominic, who's going to give us, because this is a round table event, a virtual round table event. What we're going to have is a little bit of an introduction from Dominic and then also uh, move on to Sarah and Ross from City University. So if um, Dominic, while I set up, you wanted to run a questionnaire. So. While I'm setting that up, I wondered if you wanted to come on, share your slides, and I'll get your question up and running. Yes, thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm hoping I can share my slides. And they should be coming up shortly. There they are, with a beautiful, AI generated image of a robot holding a book in an ancient library with some uh, nice patterns in the background as well to show us that uh, we are in new and different times. Now, I wanted to start off by maybe asking you all a question. What is your experience with ChatGPT? Because we keep saying AI, but we really sort of mean ChatGPT and, and the others as well. So here are the five options or four options. I use it almost every day. I've played around with it, use it sometimes, heard a lot about it, or I've heard something about it, not something that I, you know, so, so I'm just seeing some Responses there. I saw some responses coming up, but they seem to have disappeared now. Oh, okay, I see. I'll release it in a sec. Everybody's having right. a little go. All right, okay, good. Good. Okay. So uh so we're setting some responses. And while you while we're waiting for the response to the poll, I want to ask you a next question to answer in the chat. Uh what do you think about ChatGPT? What is it? What were your impressions if you use it or not? Okay, so we have uh, a small percentage of people, nine people who use it almost every day, 47 have, uh, of people have played around with it, that's the majority, and then some, lots of people have heard a lot about it, and some people have just heard a few things about it, so we're seeing that uh, there in the uh, in, in the numbers, um, and rather than the percentages. So in the chat, what are your impressions? What do you think about this so far? Just going to see what some responses are. Uh, chat generated possibly true okay so that's 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 a good one and uh biggest challenge my sense of ethical practice so amazing opportunities like the potential great uh, mixed views some people yeah some things are good some experience is good some less useful when used on certain applications contexts very good okay a lot of promise wonderful okay does cause academic integrity uh, skill, uh, concerns, loss of skills, potential, um, or danger. Has used Google Bard somebody? Okay, so I, I guess I should have uh, dangerous for plagiarism. All right, wonderful. Okay, yeah. So those, 
but I like what Brian has to say. Solves the fear of the empty page, right? That's that's an interesting one. That's was one of the first reactions I've heard from many people who are who work in a neurodiversity uh, uh, <laughs> space. Somebody saying Google Bard is even worse than ChatGPT. Okay, well let's have a look about that. Useful primer for critical thinking. Wonderful, because those are all great and interesting responses. I'm not going to read through them all, but you know, feel free to continue. Uh, as as you as as you go through these, so let me just kind of start just quickly in five minutes and do a quick introduction to what I think is perhaps wor worth keeping in mind as we continue that discussion for the next hour. So just to introduce myself, I work at the Oxford University. I'm the Assistant Technology Officer, and I also run the Reading and Writing Innovation Lab, uh, where I look at e-readers, tablets, uh, styluses, reading apps, writing tools, but also many different strategies, and people can visit me and feel free if you're ever in Oxford, let me know. I'll be happy to show you around as well. So I think really the, when I want to answer that question, I want to ask ourselves the question, what is neurodiversity really? What is what, what, what are the barriers that we're worrying about, right? And so it's things to do with language, money, even though that doesn't seem like neurodiversity, but that's has definitely a dimension. And complexity is perhaps the one that's the, more, the most relevant. And there's different things that are happening when it comes to your diversity. There's cognition, but there's organization, both sort of mental and physical, socialization, emotion, but also perception. You know, that those all things kind of relate to each other. So those are all things that we might be thinking about relate, reacting to when we think about neurodiversity. And what is, what is involved in that? So in cognition, that's, those are the, the big ones, right? Dyslexia, issues with decoding, attention, ADHD, understanding, SLI, speech and language impairment, then we have organization. Again, that's those different cognitive organization issues, task-based um, organization issues that have dyslexia, ADHD share, but also physical like dyspraxia. Socialization, we're talking about people struggling with social cues or fitting in as a consequence of other issues. There's the emotional aspect. You know, there's directly anxiety and depression you know, or so a source of issues, but also there can be a result uh, or there could be sensitive to, to stimuli. There's lots of things that are happening there. And we're interested in perception, sight, hearing, but also touch and so on. So those are all things that are happening there, but also it's not very straightforward. There are issues that are permanent, temporary, and situational. So it's not always uh, clear what, 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 you know, what that means when talk somebody has an issue or something like that. And here's a quite well-known uh, chart from Microsoft's design, inclusive design principles. So how does AI fit in, right? And so the first question, uh, you know, we have the big three that I started off with, and so it's language, money, complexity, and so does it help with language? It's incredibly good at languages. Uh, money, despite people's concern about uh, all, all the costs, it's actually much cheaper than many other things that are out there. And complexity, I want to show you, is in a way the most powerful aspect of where AI can help in those in sort of big, big three excluding vectors. But of course, we have to ask, which AI are we talking about? So I already said we mostly mean ChatGPT nowadays, right? So there's this big circle of the so-called good old artificial intelligence, you know, Go, GoFi. Uh, and then machine learning is a subset of it. It's, that's not all of it. And then neural networks, which is what we have, is even a smaller subset. So, you know, the old style AI was the old things, the sort of expert systems, old style chatbots, they're really out of the game. Spam filters used to be called artificial intelligence, Google search also, things like that, but also just basic spell check. Also, that really isn't much what we're talking about. Nowadays, what we're talking about is things like image labeling, the really good spell check, the grammar checking, the fluent speech recognition, and ChatGPT, and of course, making images. Right? So those are the things that we really mean. So nowadays, there's the other AI, only one relevant distinction, and then there's the generative AI, which is what we're talking about. ChatGPT, images, really natural text-to-speech, all of these things out there. And so when it comes to neurodiversity, we might be interested in solving some of these problems, like helping with the, with the cognition, creating bullets, outlines, summaries, organization, plans, outlines, charts, socialization, providing people with script scenarios, decreasing demand on time, helping with emotional aspects of conversation, motivational stories, perception, we can translate between different modalities. And so how can AI help with any of these? Well, yes, it can. Before ChatGPT, we were using things like speech recognition and text-to-speech or even spell check. Those were incredibly helpful. But nowadays, ChatGPT can help with all of these other things in different interesting ways that we still have to discover how to actually make them fit into this support structure. So it can help with what I'm calling cognitive scaffolding, it can provide emotional support, it can create learning tools for us. So let's just see a uh, quick example of that. So it's a really a new paradigm for how a computer can assist. So for example, I gave it a long article and asking, who are all the people mentioned in this article? 
right? So they gave me a list, but that list was quite hard to read and maybe not as useful, so I had to make it into a table. And add to that table uh, what, how were they, what, where they're from, what is their role, what they actually said. And all of a sudden, I have a way of approaching that article that may be really difficult for me to read otherwise because of the various issues that I may have. Uh, I have a structure. I have this cognitive scaffolding to approach this. But that can take very interesting, unexpected uh, forms as well. So, for example, I've talked to a student who studies medicine. And said, well, he uses uh, ChatGPT to create little poems to help memorize these long, long lists uh, with uh, of long, long lists of of, um, of terms and so on. And here again, we can use it to create examples and counterexamples. Here's another example of something that I used recently. You're starting to re your reading process. You're not helping with exact reading. You're starting thinking about, for example, working memory in this case. So I ask it, make me a list of working memory terms. But that was a long list, hard to really deal with. So I say, okay, make me a, a sub list, break it into categories. Here it is. But that was one of the categories was too long. So can you make subcategories of that? Again, it made them. It's not that important here for me as a student that the categories are right. It's important that it's helping me start in thinking, building mental structures that I can then approach complex concept with. And of course, I can do even better. I can create into a I can make it into a table with flashcards, build relationships in that. And again, when I work with students, I always tell them, tell them, this is just a hypothesis you're testing. These are not the answers, but this is a way for you to approach complex issues. And of course, you can also take it further and, and apply it with other tools. So for example, I ask it make me a list of propositions, then I asked it to make it into a table. And then I took that table and pasted it into CMAP, this concept mapping tool, and that showed me how those concepts relate to each other. So ChatGPT didn't make this for me, but it made it possible for me to make it easier to start thinking about this in, in context. So that's really, that's that's really the you know, some examples of where I think this is incredibly powerful. And my sort of last statement, what I think is just to get us thinking about, we're probably not using it enough to help ourselves as we work and also our students. So, so that's kind of where I wanted to leave my introduction, where I'm coming from, what I'm thinking about, and, uh, and uh, pass over to the other panelists. So thank you. Thanks very much, Dominic. Yeah, that was a gr that was a great start. Kind of, I love this idea of cognitive scaffolding. A really useful way of thinking about that. I'd like to hand over to Sarah Hop from City to perhaps introduce yourself. Get on the mic, Sarah. Hello. Hello. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I haven't used this platform before. Um, Ross is trying, has been trying to get in for the last 10 minutes, but unfortunately he can't get into the meeting. So um, hopefully Sandra's just trying to, to help him get in at the moment. So apologies. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Hopp from um, the City University of London. Um, and I'm the uh, Student Disability and Neurodiversity um, uh, a manager um, and I manage a team of uh, neurodiversity study skills tutors and I also manage a team of um, um, <clears throat> D&D &D &D advisors. Um, the main change, <coughs> sorry excuse me, the main change that we have, um, <coughs> sorry I've got really bad hay fever so I apologise for the cough, um, the main change that we've made in the university um, in the department this year has been a switch over to a, a person-centred support. So rather than before someone would come in, they'd give their um, they'd give their um, diagnosis and they'd say these are the reasonable adjustments that you can have, and that's it. Um, thank you very much. Off you go. And what we've done now is the first two sessions of the student telling their story, um, so that they can have a holistic approach and they choose what support they want. Now, what the pattern that's coming out uh, from us at the moment is that um, students are, are not not they're not encouraged at secondary school at sixth form college to be using assistive technology in AI as part of an integral part of their support. Um, so what we the challenge that we've had and that we've been working with Sandra's team in Leeds with is is to try and create an environment where students are encouraged to, to make that leap that, that um, into to, um, developing skills with assistive technology um, and lots of different things like that um, so that they can they can be more autonomous um, and they can be more flexible in their learning etc and it's this is a real challenge that we've faced so so many students have had before they've had 
um, students coming in that are um, that they've got um, learning support assistants that are human, note takers that are human, and they are just they just refuse point blank to say no, nope, we're not going to do it, we're not going to use AI. And there is so much as I've just seen in the my, the previous presentation, which is great. There's so much out there, and it, it could it's absolutely life changing for students. Um, and so for the students that are taking making use of it, it's really good. Um, so what we're doing is we've started to, to create an NHE transition program um, and what we're doing in September is we're going to be introducing, we're doing workshops introducing students to assistive technologies, different types of assistive technologies and AI um, as part of their integral support so that they can, um, they can um, develop these skills over the time and, and be more open minded about accepting support. I think it's it's a real travesty that in schools and colleges, when you have a, a student has a, a, an education, health and care plan, that it's still assistive technology is still not in there. Assistive technology is still about teach uh, speech to text software and things like that and dragon dictate and, and they all have their place um, or it'll be have an extra laptop, but there is no real focus. It's almost as if it, 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 you've got uh, IT as a subject, but then nothing um there's there's nothing overarching there's nothing that's sort of embedded within and, and i think that really uh, uh, from primary to secondary level that there really needs to be a push with education health and care plans that these skills that are so important to students are um are, are developed i'm supporting now um stu phd students who would quite easily be able to complete their dissertations and they don't need human note takers to human transcribers and yet they are insisting on having them it costs the university money it costs it, it's um you know it takes up so much time and yet there is so much sophisticated software out there so the challenge for us really is over time is building in workshops building up skills so that students have more autonomy So and and so so that's and, and that that's where we are at the moment. We we really are at, at sort of the the embryonic stages of that. I don't know whether Ross has managed to get into the meeting yet or not. Yeah, not not sure about Ross, but as soon as he joins, we can um, uh, add him to the conversation. Well, that was really interesting. Let's get and and we're all at this embryonic stage, you know. I'd, um, yeah. Uh, I think I'd like to start with um, uh, Emma and Jess, if, if you can catch up with any questions that have come through and, and please anybody contribute. This is your chance now to ask or uh, raise pertinent questions and, and points. But I'd like to start with, um, obviously this is moving at breakneck speed and you know, we're struggling as Sarah and Dominic pointed out, you know, struggling to catch up. Are we jumping too fast? For instance, this idea of of replacement replacement of note takers, these sorts of things. Is this going to take a while to bed in or um, it's is it's so obvious of the benefits that we just you know, where where might be the risks, I guess. And I, th I think I think the risks are I think there's things that have, I think at second primary and secondary level everything is so funding driven that and and not student centred. So um, I come from my previous job was as a senko in a sixth form college, um, and I um, mentored senkos trainee senkos across primary schools and secondary schools. And Senko, you know, the Senko job is really one that is, it's, um, you know, they're the unsung heroes really because it's never ever ending and the, the volume of it is so much. But when you have, and there are a lot of colleagues in local authorities who are also working very hard, but they're not seeing every, the, the, the paperwork is, this is centered based. It's a, it's a team around the student, a team around the child. But the team really isn't really focusing on the skills that the child will need as an adult, that the child will need to be autonomous. And AI is a massive one there. So I think it's difficult because the risks are that schools don't have enough funding 
for AI. When, when the government's saying, well, there should be a focus on AI, there's a focus on coding and, and everything else like this. So that's, that's one risk, so it's financial risk. I think the other risk is, is trust. So the problem is, is that by the time students come to us at university, they're adults and, and they've learned one way of learning and that is relying on another human. So the, the risk then is, is gaining that trust. Now we have students in for like one or two but, but it, it, uh, years or it's three or four years. That's not enough time really to be able to, to turn someone around and say, okay, and, and get them to use assistive technology. It's possible and we, we do do it with some students. But I think it's, it really needs a sort of right from primary age all the way through to secondary. And unfortunately, that's something that's only going to take time. And I think it's going to take a lot of lobbying to government as well, I think. I just pass that over to Dominic, and then I think we've got some questions coming in. Go on, Dominic. Yeah, so this, there's, two, there's two aspects to this. Uh, and... I think some of the things that people are mentioning, uh, mentioning in the chat as well, is is the the speed of the change, right? And the dif and the difficulty of knowing what's coming, what's coming next, and what can be done and what cannot be done. So we can. And the biggest danger here is extrapolating in the wrong direction <laughs> from what we know AI can do. So I, for example. You know, we can, we're quite amazed by what speech dictation can do, you know, when we dictate nowadays with the, the new improved technologies. But then we're kind of appalled how bad lecture transcriptions is still, automated lecture transcription is, because we're, sometimes it's hard to extrapolate for that. And in a way, I've had that from the very beginning of AI, people of speech recognition, people are always coming to me, I can dictate into my computer, I have a recording I'd like to have transcribed. And, and now it's at least decently usable, but five years ago it was completely unusable. So it was a huge disconnect between, on the one hand, seemed like it can do it, but on the other hand, the inference you make from it was completely wrong, right? It just, you know, that was not your fault, but essentially that was not, you wouldn't know that, that you cannot take the next step. And I, so a lot of the things that we're seeing right now is, is of that nature. We're seeing these amazing things that are happening and we're also seeing some sort of silly errors happening as well. And we're, we're trying to find a way of thinking about the future. How will we extrapolate from that into the next step? What can it do? And we're in a stage of discovery, but it's a very strange kind of discovery. In the old days, you know, when we had uh, a VLE or a new piece of software, you just kind of played around with it and you figured out what it can do. And then you learn from other people how they can use it. But with these new tools, we don't. We have another layer, which is people figuring out a completely different way of thinking about them. And so things that were true in uh, in February about what ChatGPT can do for you are not true anymore. Not just because of advances in technology, but because of advances in people's thinking about how, what can be done with it. But also in uh, in terms of other tools that are happening that are integrating with it. And the problem is that there isn't one place that you can go and, and learn all of this. These, these updates are happening in, on Reddit, on Twitter, in blog posts, YouTube videos, there's newsletters, there's, there's Substack. And so all of a sudden, if you want to keep on top of it, which is what I'm trying to do, uh, this is not something you can just rely on the news reports here and there or some sort of an easy checklist of things you can do, that you can or cannot do. So, so, so the, 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 the journey from knowing it exists to knowing how to use it in a useful way is quite is quite a difficult and complex one yeah so <laughs> it yeah it does it sort of summarize in those two points that we're still in that discovery phase but um there's yeah. i guess that expanding on sarah on your idea of trust I guess you know we're we're all trying to develop that in in, in many different levels, aren't we, at the moment? Yeah. I, Emma, I wonder if I could lean on you. I wonder if there's anything happening in the chat uh, space that you wanted to bring forward. If you want to jump on the mic, Emma.
And I see we have raised hand as well, Jim. I don't know if we. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. While we're waiting for Emma, Mike, do you want to come? come yeah. On. I mean, I put it in the chat, but um, AI literacy. I mean, at the moment, we seem to have prompt engineering literacy. You know, chat GTP3 literacy. Chat, you know, AI bard lit. I mean, where are we going with this? Um, but, you know, the, the developers of OpenAI say they don't quite understand how it works, even though they built it. Um, you know, how much do people actually have to understand? I mean, if you take, it's very hard to come up with an analogy for this. For example, if you hire a car, um, you can get any car. How long do you spend working out how to drive it before you get in and drive away? because they all work in the same way and they're designed to work in the same way. Um, so where do we go here? How much do people actually have to understand how the AI works to be able to use it? Sarah, do you want to start with that one? Could you repeat the question? I couldn't, it was my um, reception was going in and out. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Sorry, Mike. How, do you want to... how much do people have to understand how mm -hmm. the particular AI works? Because as Dominic pointed out, I mean, you know, there really isn't a definition of AI. It's, cha it's mm -hmm. you know, changing all the time. So how much do people have to understand? Because, you know, I've been on so many webinars about ChatGPT, and even though people are saying it's just generating text, it's not searching, you know, for information. Uh, most people don't seem to even understand that, even though they've read it and been told it so many times. Mm -hmm. um, so how much do people actually have to understand how the AI works and its limitations? I, I think it's quite important for people to understand how it works um, and how um, and the limitations of it as well. And I think for, for us in our services, I can only speak for us in our services, and I know that we use um, so, like uh, th those types of chats in a well-being app that we have for that in that role it is useful in a very sort of initial very initial type of, of, of sort of dialogue so to speak um, but the unfortunate thing is a lot of our students think and especially our autistic students think that this is the most effective way of communicating for them because of their anxieties and what happens is what's missing with human dialogue is that when we, um, as specialist practitioners, when we discuss things with autistic students, we're actually um, reading in between the lines. We're, we're looking at, um, we're analysing facial expression, body language, and things like that. So, um, so the, the the use of those sorts of chats, it, it does have its use, but it has its place as well, and, and it can't really replace human contact. And it's not, um, you know, I noticed in one of the chats, one of the comments was about it taking it taking away creativity. I think that AI has its place and it's as long as it's used as a tool, it won't take creativity away. I think if anything, it will enhance it. Um, it's, but it's the way in which it's used. And because for that, there needs to be understanding of what it is, how it's used and how it's used specifically. And for that, I think there needs to be a lot of training both for staff and for students. And again, like I say, in, in much in much earlier generations. And not journey, a, a, a much earlier, in the, a much earlier journey, sorry, so to speak. So it's sort of like primary school and secondary school. Dominic, have you got anything to add? Yeah, I was, was several things. So I think uh, the question, uh, you know, from Mike, and sort of many dimensions that are worth that I'm dealing with every day. I'm thinking about every day, and and we're at the moment starting to think about how can we support, as the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Oxford, the rest of the university. What is our place in this? But also, what is our place as individuals <laughs> who are doing the support in learning? And what what you know because obviously uh, there is no one easy access to expertise. That's as I mentioned earlier, right? So there is no one person who you could say this person is an AI expert uh, by dint of what they did two years ago. <laughs> so for example, as again Mike mentioned, the, the, the makers of ChatGPT didn't re I sort of dispute the fact that they don't know how it works. They know how it works, but they can't quite imagine all the things it would be able to do once different people try it. 
And that was their intention. They didn't quite realize at the beginning, once people see the, the early power of it, what, they, what else they'll be able to do with it. <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, for example, we didn't think it would be good at labeling uh, text, but now people have figured out how to use it to label text. So those are all sort of interesting things that are coming, coming from it. And uh, the, but the other question that Mike asks is, what is this like? What is a good metaphor? What is this like? What is the other thing ChatGPT is like? And I, in my other life, I actually work on metaphors. This is something that I, I study. <laughs> so I think a lot about metaphors. If you want to go to Metaphor Hacker to see me write about some of these things, you can go. You can do that. And I, the, the main thing about metaphors, you need always more than one to help you think through some of these difficult issues. And, and with, with, with ChatGPT and the generative AI in general, we need loads of them. We need to kind of switch between them all the time and think about in some ways it is like this, in other ways it is like, like something else. So, you know, in some ways people mentioned in the chat the, the worries about de-skilling. So we can think about, is it, is it kind of like calculators in the old days? We had really strong worries about calculators <laughs> and they, they haven't come true in, in many ways and as a, as a societal decline in numeracy. Uh, you know, quite the opposite in, in some ways. And the you know, same goes for spreadsheets and things like that. But they're also very much unlike calculators in the fact that they're open-ended. They, they, they can be doing different things. And one of the things that I would like to uh, bring up is the comparison with the previous AI hypes. So we heard, you know, many of you may remember IBM Watson that was being touted as the future of, of medicine. And I just uh, last month, uh, the Business School Insight released a report. Uh, and actually, let me share my screen just for a second, just to show you what, that, what it says. Uh, and, and in that report, what they, uh, what they said is, well, IBM Watson prom made a lot of promises about, uh, about what uh, it can do, what this AI is. And there was a huge gap between what happens in the lab and what happens in the field. And it turns out the lab was just completely not predictive of what would happen in the field. Plus it was a product that the sales force of, micro, of IBM was selling really hard. They were making all these claims that salespeople made. And then the management of the hospitals that tried to use it was really not taking into account all the stakeholders there. So if we compare this to the ChatGPT hype, right? This is different. All of a sudden, it's the utility of ChatGPT is really obvious to its users. They are the ones who made the hype really, it didn't come from the companies. It came from people trying it and seeing, I can do useful things with it. And also the labs are actually quite honest about the limitations. It, you know, OpenAI, every time they release a new model, they say, this is where it fails. These are the scores, these are the benchmarks and everybody else is doing it. And you know, so, so we have relative amount of honesty here compared to the previous hype. And, but it's also very much grassroots driven. It's not the management in universities and schools uh, and, and institutions who's thinking we must use this. It's the people who are, you know, who want help, who think they, it can help them. So that's the big, so I think that's kind of a useful metaphor there as well, that it's, we need to think about this as this, in the, in the context of other hyped technologies, but also, also think about it as this, as a quite a different thing that we're seeing people and look at what people are doing with it and, and help them, you know, and, and learn from that. But that's not easy because that takes time. It takes engaging with the right communities, finding the right people to follow, think about it. Uh, in, in, in complex ways. So it's almost more like introduction of computers themselves or introduction of the internet where it was new to everybody. Everybody was trying to figure it out and it took a lot of effort. Remember nine, the nineties and, and then the early two thousands, how much effort we put into training and upskilling and all these technologies. And we just may have to do that again because this is so new and we may, and maybe even harder this time because it's changing so fast. So this is not just like one new thing like VLEs or interactive mm -hmm. whiteboards. This is a completely new paradigm, possibly. You know, <laughs> well, in that, that's one of the ways that we can look at it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Dominic. Um, Dustin's been waiting. Oh, do you want to come on the mic? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I hear a lot of concern and this reminds me of COVID-19. There's a sense of paralysis, at least among some of you, and what you're saying in the comments. So I have a question, because I'm only 43 years young. To those who are much older than me, what did you do when computers were developing 
and getting more and more powerful. What did you do back in the kind of 80s and 90s? And I asked that because that changed a lot. Now, I grew up with that. I grew up with VHS, all these gaming systems, all these computer systems. So I see ChatGPT as an annoyance because it's making you guys anxious. It's making me anxious because you are anxious. And I'm like, why don't you just get on with it? Why don't you try it? Why don't you play around with it? Uh, and Martin Compton is a great source of some good examples. But I guess the question is, what are you doing to get to know it, to put your anxieties to the side, and to see that, by the way, as a person of ADHD, I have ADHD, it can be really helpful for tackling certain things, for getting a different perspective, you know, when doing various things. The tone thing was right on the mark. Someone mentioned tone, checking an email with tone. It's great at that. It's not perfect. But I can't go on a course to teach me that because work's not going to pay for that. <laughs> okay. So what are you doing? That's great. Yeah. So Sarah, uh, in terms of trying to find the connection between AI and neurodiversity, what, what sort of everyday things are you doing? So like I said before, we're sort of we're running workshops. So first of all, we had um, at the beginning of the year, we worked in collaboration with Sandra Partington's team um, lead. Um, we worked with um, that they gave us a lot of training and we gave them training on neurodiversity. So interdepartmental collaboration. Um, and that then was the beginning of um, working together um, sort of and thinking about things like possible workshops for students, workshops for staff, um, and then creating sort of thinking about different spaces. So, for example, HE transition days, welcome days where um, both departments could have um, a presence um, at the, all those sorts of functions where students could come up and, and ask questions as well. Um, and sort of um, trying to, to build on sort of starting off just trying to sort of build packages of support together so for example our students have what's called a student support plan an ssp so the ssp would put in about um using the at room the assistive technology rooms um and having an induction so we would make sure that that induction was part of that student support plan um that an induction to using caption ed for example was part of that plan as well. So it's making, so it's not just putting down the assistive technology or the AI on the student support plan and saying this is this is what the student is entitled to, but it's actually putting down on on those support plans the the um, the induction for it, the workshops for them, and things like that, things that will enhance. So that doctoral students, we've come up with a program of a series of workshops, um, and one of those workshops is focusing on AI um, and transcription services um, that are available um, and things like that. So, so that's that's where we are at the moment. But there's there's so much more to do um, really on that. But, but it really, like I said before, it's, it's embryonic stages. Brilliant. Dominic, do you want to expand upon that? Yeah, I, well, in a way, sort of, uh, let me just put up my screen again for uh, really quickly. So Dustin really kind of uh, reinforced the point that I was I was trying to make, right? And and it, and the, I really think this is the, the important challenge. What are you doing? And one of the things I'm a bit worried about, we keep saying, oh, we must support our students in using AI correctly. But I don't think uh, that we, we don't quite know yet how to do it. So uh, so I want to. So this is the point that I ended on. You know, we are probably not using it enough to help ourselves or our students. So somebody mentioned in the chat that they find it uh, to distract, annoying, unreliable, and, and those are all true things. But maybe, uh, but also uh, somebody said people are not using it because they've tried it and it gave them stupid answers, and that's true. But but the problem with it is that sometimes you need to start thinking and developing ways of interacting with it. So. There's sort of two different initial reactions people have to. One is it's inaccurate, unreliable, probably more trouble than it's worth. And the other one is, well, actually, it's helping me with the things that were too difficult and the checking of it. We're going from a place where checking things was more difficult 
uh, or fixing things was more difficult than uh, than doing it yourself. But now we're, many people are finding that actually all the work it's doing is helping them. So let me just show you an example of a conversation that happened yesterday uh, that sort of showed me how I'm underusing ChatGPT myself. So I was uh, talking with a staff member about, we're having this project about screen reuse. And she asked me, can you give me a quick link so that I can start learning how to use a screen reader? And I said, you know what? I haven't really found any good links, any good descriptions for, for that kind of usage, right? There are lots of guides for uh, people doing it professionally, but nothing that's a good introduction. And so what I did after we hung up, I said, you know what? Let me ask ChatGPT, and I used the more advanced model uh, for that. And it gave me sort of a fairly vacuous response to the first bit. You know, so it was the best way to get started with a screen reader. But I said, you know what? I now have one of the tools recommended, how to use it. And what it gave me is this wonderful step-by-step, -step, and, and I happen to know NVDA enough that I know it's all correct at a glance. And then, and then uh, it gave me uh, more information when I asked for it. So I keep on asking, expanding. And then after a while, it also gave me, when I asked it, a, a really nice outline of how I could do it step-by-step -step in six 30 minute session. So, so, so I can have that curriculum and I can create a table of the shortcuts that I needed for that, just like that. And what I could use then is new feature of ChatGPT where I can share a link of my chat. So I took that link, copied it, and I sent it to the, to the person. And what they can now do at the bottom is this new button that says continue this conversation. And so, so she can then now go and use ChatGPT if she has an account. She can just use it as a, as a guide, that's a good guide, or she can go and use it uh, to ask further questions and, and, and elaborate on it and, and keep continue learning from it. So all of a sudden, uh, this is me under using ChatGPT when I could have used it to create a tool that I've always wanted to create a guide like that, I just never had the time. So all of a sudden, immediately, uh, I, uh, I have a good starting point and, and something that I could use immediately. So it's an example of, of a really use, but it's really because it, I, I'm constantly trying to look at others and learning from others. How, to, how are you using it? What are you finding the strong points? And that's really kind of the necessary thing. So it's not. So one of the dangers in there is to just say we need to go try it because just trying it is probably not going to get you there. It's you need to kind of learn from others as well. There's just so much happening. So my one plea for everybody is to if if you if you'd like to, uh, there's the one piece of advice I can give everybody, take a prompt engineering course, right? If asking ChatGPT things is called prompt engineering. There's on Coursera, there's a really good beginner prompt engineering course for ChatGPT that takes you through the steps. And, and that's a good place to start, right? It doesn't do away with all the problems ChatGPT has about hallucinations and so on, but it will it will let you learn things, you help you learn things like how to how to prompt it better so that you can go from a from a result that isn't very good, like uh, you know, I can tell you more about this, where you prompt it give it examples and all of a sudden can give you a result that's much more like what you wanted. So that's something that I would I would recommend for people to take this seriously. This is a learning process. But even if you take, do take that course, that is not going to be the end of it. It's just the beginning of a journey. And going back to what Dustin said, this is a lot, right? I know I'm asking you a lot, but also this is a lot of new stuff. So that's kind of, we're back in the 90s where all of this, because I was there in the 90s and I, I was taking courses and teaching courses on like introducing people to computers. And so I know this is not a small, small ask, but that is the ta that is really the, the demand of the moment, I think. Okay. And perhaps that relates, uh, Rob asked in the chat, uh, has anyone completed an equality impact analysis or data protection guidance for using AI tools? Do we inform staff and students what happens to the data they submit? Are all tools accessible for all? Do they increase the digital divide? A lot to unpack there. Let's start with Sarah. I don't know if you can see that um, uh, one in there. Do you want me to repeat the question, Sarah? Oh, your mic's yeah, off. Yeah, sorry, please. I've got, this is still on my end and it's <laughs> going in and out all the time, sorry. Here we go. Has anyone completed an equality impact analysis or data protection guidance for using AI tools? Do we inform staff and students of what happens to the data they submit? Is this something that you're worried about, Sarah, in the work that you're doing at the moment? I think it is. I think it's a concern. We've, we're just moving at the moment to something called Support at City. So it's a, new, it's a completely new platform. And one of the things that are, we're concerned about, that staff are concerned about in my teams, are about um, sort of um, 
the, the security of it um, and also about um, sort of collecting data and how that data is collected, etc. And I think that, and it's partly because we, we the, the creators of this program, because they are well informed about um, IT um, and AI, etc. And as you can tell, I, I'm not of that ilk. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's very easy for them to trust the system, so to speak. But for us, it's it's much more difficult. Um, and I think as well, going back to the training, uh, Sandra's team are fantastic, and the way that they um, told the, the way that they informed us, the way that they trained us on the, the use of the AI was it, it, it was very much because we're creative thinkers and we think all over the place and things like that. And I'm not putting I'm generalizing here, but for me, speaking personally as a neurodivergent person who's dyspraxic, it's very it was very easy for me to, to, to understand because it was coming from a, 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 someone else who was thinking creatively. Um, I've been in other training sessions where the person has been very knowledgeable, but it's come from a very systematized way of thinking. And that for me would be very difficult to understand. And, you know, it, that person, bless them, has sat there with me and broken it down so much. And they've said to me, you know, and you, you can see on their faces like, what don't you get? But for some reason, for me, if it's too systematized and if it's too sort of, if it goes by steps and, and the flow charts and things like that, I, it just will not compute with my brain. I don't know why. So I think anything sort of designing training needs to have in mind, bear in mind the different types of thinking. So, you know, a lot of our students, autistic students are very good at systematization. They're very good at finding patterns and things like that um, and coding and that sort of thing. Um, but there are others of us, like some of us with ADHD or dyspraxics um, or, you know, who are, are very sort of, visual all over the place thinkers you know we're, we're very messy people sort of things and and so a, a very sort of creative way of getting the message across to us is it, it, it works uh, really well um and i think that, <laughs> that that's you know my very sort of like clunky way of explaining it but i think that's one of the difficulties that we've come across with with our students well and part of the reluctance as well for staff as well as students is is it's it's making that training accessible to everybody and different types of, of learning and understanding. If that makes sense. Yeah. And Dominic, are you going back to the question? Are you concerned about data protection and uh, these sorts of things? No, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, not 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 in any other way that I would be with anything else, right? People sending emails. You know, I, I think my sort of my sort of the standard of comparison. I always want to, um, you know, be aware of the status quo bias, right? So if we ask people to send emails, are we are they really? Is that any more secure uh, than than putting stuff into ChatGPT? And the answer is no. Uh, so as long as we're happy to communicate with people by email, we're kind of <laughs> doing those very same things. So I don't think there's any extra dangers. I'm not saying there are no dangers. There are no sort of concerns to be had. Uh, but uh, as I said, many of these mainstream tools are quite open about what they use the data for and what they don't. You know, the open AI now lets you delete all your old data. They, they let you, they're happy to exclude it. They're not actually training live on your responses. They said they may use it for fine tuning, but they're not doing that. So obviously many, but the other concern about uh, the reality of it is that many companies have banned the use of chat gpt because of this right it's, it's entirely possible that uh, if you're running a bit, lots of trade secrets that may be a problem but what they're finding a lot of their users are using their own machines to do it <laughs> because they're finding it so helpful right so that i think that that is just the reality of it so in some ways um we're, we're seeing you know we're, we're it's a slightly new space but i'm not necessarily seeing anything that's vastling you in terms of uh, privacy or data protection issues than the things we're using right now. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, Nikki, you've just put your hand up. Do you want to come on the mic? We're getting into our last uh, 10 minutes here. So if people have got uh, something burning uh, issue, that, oh, go on. 
Yeah. Hi, um, Nikki. Yeah. Hello, just because I am a SENCO in a secondary school, and you said you want us to be using more IA to prepare our students for further education. I just want to know what I should be doing. <laughs> Brilliant question. Sarah? I think that's a good question. And I think having been a SENCO myself, it, it's difficult. I think it's it's really difficult because it comes from a sort of a, it's systemically from, from the, the school. So the, the, the principal or, or the head teacher should really be making it part of the, 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 the curriculum. And as a SENCO, you've only got so much power. There's only so much that you can do. So I think if I was if back in my old post, what I would be doing is I would be contacting um, sort of lots of um, different um, associations, for example, um, diversity and ability, um, and looking into the different types of AI that that, that they put, that they have for students, um, and they have sort of like really good demos and things like that. And I think sort of, and then making that part of any sort of support plans as well. So, um, sort of he helping the students to access mm -hmm. free demos and stuff like that, and then being if in their one-to-one -one support sessions they can use some of that assistive technology the speech to text software um the organizational skills type software and stuff like that and, and then so it becomes sort of like part of almost like their daily practice but it is difficult when you know you've got different schools with different amounts of funding um, you don't always have the hardware or, or the software available and you don't always have the budget so it's really difficult to try to try and do that but i think what I would be doing is having a conversation with the head teachers um, and even, you know, taking it to sort of like um, governor's level sort of thing and for, for, the, for the importance of this, because what I can see happening, being now at a university, a manager at a university, what I can see happening is whether we like it or not, it, the AI is coming and th these students are going to have to have these skills in, in order to be able to cope at university. Um, it, the problem is, is that the government and, and schools and colleges haven't put this infrastructure in, which makes our, our jobs as SENCOs really, really difficult. I think that's pretty helpful. Dominic, have you got other things to add? Yeah, and in a way to kind of also respond to what other people were saying in the chat, because there's a bit of a discussion about chat. Is this actually useful for somebody who has mm -hmm. an issue? Uh, or not, right? So some, I think some people are saying, mm -hmm. well, this is actually the worst thing for neurodivergent people. And I don't like the word neurodivergent people, right? Neurodiversity is a concept about the, about a lot of people. <laughs> people are different, have different needs. Nobody, one is, you know, everybody has different di you know, dimensions of neurodiversity. So I think in a way, we need to start thinking about what is the, what, what the individual can do with this. So I can certainly agree that and I apologize, you know, my presentation was quite quick and speedy and perhaps confusing uh, to some people. But I, uh, I'm just trying to show examples of where people can develop this notion of, of some scaffolding and, and help. And that's something that takes time. So even though I show these things like quick flashes of here's this, 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 if I'm working with a student, what I'm actually saying, here are, here's the first step. This is, here's something that uh, you should be creating for yourself when you're reading a text, for example, a table like that, or, or a summary or bullet points or outlines. Or if you're writing an essay, you should again be creating these outlines, but these students find it incredibly difficult. So in a way I'm saying, here is your first draft. Here's something that you can help you with that guide. And it's a slow process. So, so this is not necessarily something that, be, even though I showed it in a flash, this is what's going to help somebody in a flash, right? And so some people also have to think, figure out how can I, make ChatGPT not give me too much information because often it is guilty of that, right? It just tells you all this other stuff as well as what you ask for. And there's ways of uh, there's ways of using it for that. And I'm just using ChatGPT, but that will be true of, of other things. And it's also important to uh, help them understand some of the issues around the prompt engineering. What is What does it make sense to ask? Because somebody said in the chat, has to do count the number of syllables. And that's the worst thing you can ask your GPT to do because that, it's, it's, it's absolutely awful at that. <laughs> and there's good reasons for it, but it's not saying it should be good at it. We just, you know, so that's one of those things that, that is important to, to think about as well. And so that's that journey. And if you're trying to prepare a secondary school student for university, well, just prepare them for the fact that, that they need to start organizing their thought and organizing their reading and organizing their writing and note-taking in, even in a more systematic way. 
And if they if that they find it difficult now, they're going to be finding it more difficult later. And so if they can actually start developing these first steps of using some like ChatGPT to help them with this, and that can be beneficial. But not as a as I may have made it seem, you know, I apologize for that. It's like, it's just snap your fingers and you're done, right? The, the, the hard work is just beginning after you have that done. But in a way, maybe you could not have even, maybe before that, you could not have even gotten started on the hard work because it would just be too hard to even deal with the text that you're trying to extract some information from. So, so that's kind of the, that, that's my perspective on this, right? This is always going, to, reading and writing and, and dealing with complex ideas is hard and it's always going to be hard and it's just harder for some people because some of these difficulties. So if we can find some ways of streamlining this, like I tried to show some examples, then that's all to the good, but it's still going to be hard because they still have to do some of the hard work of thinking and, and integrating that. So I just wanted to make sure that I didn't give a mistaken impression of this is so easy now that we just can snap our fingers and chat GPT gives something to us. Yeah, uh, we've down to the wire now. Emma's got her hand up. Emma? Um, can you hear me now? Because I think you couldn't hear me when I was talking earlier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we can hear you. Yeah. Good. Um, um, there's a couple of questions that haven't been answered, in particular one from Rennie about assessment. Um, take it away. Now, we've obviously only got a minute, so I don't know what Sarah <laughs> or Dominic could say in half a minute about <laughs> assessment. Um, but she has had it um, no. in the question channel for quite some time, that no, question. I apologize. So I kind of Sorry. wanted to get it in for her. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I can maybe say one thing. <laughs> and the one phrase that sort of stuck with me is, is the death of homework. AI is the death of homework. So many of the things that, uh, that we thought AI could not meaningful it could not be meaningfully done by a student. You just have to ask somebody else to do it if you want to cheat. Mm -hmm. And now meaningfully contribute to your work. And I think that's that's something to keep in mind is that in some ways we don't quite know yet of all the things that are going to come, but in some ways we need to start thinking about how uh, how we can think about assessment in the age of AI and start assessing things in the sort of famous Vygotsky zone of proximal development sense, assessing with AI rather than rather than rather than without it. And and funnily enough, the example I showed you, if the link sharing a link of your AI conversation conversation with ChatGPT is the one thing you cannot use ChatGPT to help you cheat on <laughs> because you have to do it yourself. So in some ways, it's one, one thing that if I ask a student to submit that, I know they have, they, you know, they, they have to do some of the work there unless they ask somebody else to do it for them. So that's just kind of my you know, one minute <laughs> response to that. Okay, Sarah, last point. Oh. <laughs> I, think, um, I think as far as, well, because I'm a neurodiversity manager, so my area of, of that, and I agree with my colleague, neurodiversity does mean there is no such thing as neurotypicality. Everyone is neurodiverse, but there is some of us that have different types of challenges <laughs> if, if we're dyspraxic, dyslexic, etc. And so it's those cohort of students that I'm talking about. And for me, I think assessment needs to be discussed more about, there needs to be, um, you know, uh, the, the, about the individual and sort of a move away maybe from written and typed um, assessment for some students to vivas, um, different ways, creative ways, and, and we can use AI as a tool for this, creative ways of assessing students. Um, there are a whole cohort of students that have just been missed out uh, where, where they're very uh, talented, uh, very mm -hmm. knowledgeable, but because they don't mm -hmm. work right in a certain way, um, um, they, they've actually sort of, they've been missed and, it, and it's such a shame. Yeah, and that's, a, I think that's a ideal point to end on. Emma, don't you think, or is, am I missing an extra question? No, kind no, of run out I, of time anyway. Yeah, we've run out of time. There were a couple